The following program is a production of KSPS Public Television and is made possible by the Friends of Seven. Production of this program was made possible in part by a grant from Foundation Northwest, the community foundation helping good people do great things through philanthropy. The United States is recognized throughout the world as a sovereign nation. It has its own land and laws and independent authority to govern them. One thing often unrecognized, however, is that there are other nations situated within the United States that also have their own land and laws. By definition, some Native American tribes also have sovereignty as nations. The first hour of Sovereign Nations retraced the path of inland Northwest history forged by Native American tribes and a fledgling U.S. government. Now we look at how that past influences the way people are navigating the roads to their future. In present times, society looks favorably upon those who pursue their cultural roots. Most Americans feel it is important to know and understand one's heritage. Many Native Americans feel this quest is more important to them than most. I think it's really important for Indian children because of our history and because we've lost so many people and because we do have a, a culture and a heritage that is so different from the rest of the society. Powwows offer a very visual display of this culture. For the casual observer, it's a show, but for those who participate, it holds a much deeper meaning. Each dance, each song has its own story, stories which are passed on from one generation to the next. kids, you know, if they ever want to stay here or move back to the reservation, you know, things will be all right because they can, they'll know they can survive when they leave there again. They can be proud of who they are and wherever they go, you know, they, they're not going to be taken away from their culture. This, however, has not always been the case. Native Americans have traveled a difficult path through the annals of American history. In 1855, the U.S. government signed a series of six treaties with native tribes throughout what is now Washington State. According to the treaties, the tribes involved gave up 64 million acres of land. In turn, the U.S. government guaranteed to provide for their education, health, and welfare. The tribes kept the rights to fish and hunt, and the government said it would protect them against encroachment and attack. 
By giving up land they could not keep by force, the tribes hoped to safeguard their futures. However, it took four years for these treaties to become law, and many of their provisions were ignored. So during this same time period, tensions grew between the tribes of the inland Northwest and the U.S. Army. Since these tribes had no treaties at all with the government, tension finally gave way to war. In 1858, the battles of Steptoe, Four Lakes, and the Spokane Plains were fought between the Army and an alliance comprised of Coeur d'Alene, Spokane, Palouse, and Yakima. It was the only time the Coeur d'Alene and Spokane ever took up arms against the United States. When these tribes were defeated by the U.S. Army late in the fall of 1858, they too were forced to sign peace treaties with the government. However, it would be decades before these tribes relinquished their claims to the vast tracts of land that had been their ancestral homes. The Colville Reservation was established by executive order of President Ulysses S. Grant in 1872. Later that same year, another executive order drastically reduced its boundaries. It was established for uh, certain tribes, uh, several of which never came to the Colville Reservation, like the Spokane and Coeur d'Alene, uh, and for several other tribes that did come here, like the Okanagan and the, the Spelum, Sampoel, uh, and Colville, who actually did come here at that time, and such other Indians as the United States might thereafter, with the consent of the tribes here, choose to place here. And that last phrase was the vehicle for having a number of other tribes come to the Colville Reservation between about 1879 and about 1905. So today, the Colville Reservation encompasses 1.4 million acres of the northeast corner of Washington and is home to 12 different bands of Native Americans. The traditional homelands of most of these tribes were well outside the reservation's boundaries. Though each had its own history, customs, and language, they were all forced to live together as one common group. It's very difficult with all the tribes put together, but uh, I think today they perhaps get along better than they ever have in, in the past. Back in the past, they had been enemies of our our tribes up here and had actually been to war with them and had raided uh, our tribe and our tribe had raided theirs. The Coeur d'Alene Reservation was established by executive order on November 8th of 1873. It covered almost 600,000 acres of what is now North Idaho. Unlike many other reservations, it was located within the more than 2 million acres the Coeur d'Alene's claimed as their homelands. The reservation was established only after Congress failed to ratify an earlier agreement, wherein the Coeur d'Alene's had agreed to relinquish their right and title to their traditional lands. As a result, it was not until March of 1887 that the Coeur d'Alene and U.S. governments finally signed a treaty that officially ceded the Coeur d'Alene's claims to lands outside the reservation. In that same treaty, the northern part of the reservation, comprised of almost 185,000 acres, were sold back to the United States for just under $232,000. On September 3rd of 1880, a council was held at Spokane Falls between Brigadier General Howard of the U.S. Army and the headman of the Spokane tribe. The government hoped to resolve the reservations question for the three bands of Spokane Indians. As a result of this council, President Rutherford B. Hayes issued an executive order on January 18, 1881. It set the boundaries around more than 154,000 acres that would be the Spokane Reservation. 
The Lower Spokane's, under the leadership of Chief Lott, moved onto the reservation shortly after it was established. However, the upper and middle bands refused to relocate. Before ceding their aboriginal land title to the United States, they wanted payment. Besides that, the reservation was located in Lower Spokane country and not considered the most desirable area for hunting and fishing. The other thing that made them reluctant to move onto the new reservation was a religious difference. The Lower Spokane's were Presbyterian converts, while most members of the upper and middle bands were Catholic. By the early 1880s, the city of Spokane boasted 1,000 residents and was rapidly becoming a center of trade. The Northern Pacific Railroad arrived in 1881, and in 1883, gold was discovered in the Coeur d'Alene Mountains of North Idaho. By early 1887, the city was an expanding metropolis with a population of 15,000. At the heart of this thriving metropolis were the falls, the same falls which had long been the Spokane's main fishing and trading center. In the face of progress, however, no regard was given to ancestral rights, and the non-reservation Spokane's were pushed aside. In this era of history, Native Americans were commonly referred to as savages, and considered to be unworthy of the very rights demanded by settlers. Fearing they would lose all claim to Aboriginal land title, the upper and middle bands of the Spokane's finally entered into an agreement with the United States. In March of 1887, they agreed to cede all claims to lands outside the Spokane Reservation. They also agreed to move to either the Spokane, Coeur d'Alene, or Flathead Reservations. As compensation, they were paid approximately $127,000 to be used to erect houses and purchase cattle, seed, and farm implements. The agreement was finally ratified by Congress on July 13, 1892, when it became law. Once the tribes were on reservations, the U.S. government discouraged their traditional lifestyles and tried to replace them with that of Euro-American society. In 1887, the U.S. government passed the Dawes Act. The Allotment Act, as it was commonly called, required that many reservation lands be divided and that each individual tribal member be assigned or allotted a parcel. The remaining land could then be reclaimed by the U.S. government and made available to homesteading settlers. They told the tribes that, uh, well, you don't have enough people to fill up all this land, and these are real hardworking, very sincere people that are going to come in here and make use of that land that you're not using. And so we're going to ask you guys to move on 80 acres, individually move on 80 acres, and then you'll become farmers. <laughs> I got to laugh at that. And then you'll be able to take care of yourselves. They were trying to change a character of a people who had developed that over <laughs> generations, generations and generations. The United States uh, treatment of tribes sort of vacillates. And we had the treaty making period, it ended in 1871. Uh, and then about the 1880s, the United States decided that tribal people should look more like everybody else, and everybody else looked like farmers. And so they decided to carve up reservations, to allot them, and to provide uh, Indian people with their 40 acres or 60 acres, depending upon where they were, that they could farm. And then they would sell off the rest of the land. So there was a policy of allowing individual um, Indian people to, to have land holdings. Of course, the agenda was to, to weaken tribal governments, to, uh, to destroy the, the communal fabric, which was the Indian way, which was not the non-Indian way. And as a result, tribes would go away. Another way that Indians were to be integrated into white society was through education. Children were sent to boarding schools where they could learn so-called civilized ways. To speak their native tongues, wear native attire, or practice native religion or culture was forbidden and harshly punished. 
they want us to get into the mainstream of life, they call it, and I don't know what they call our lives, because I thought we were alive and living, and, uh, but they wanted us to be like the white. They're trying to change us into white people, and, and they start with the language, and it started with my parents. And I know my dad said uh, he went to um, a mission school and he was punished for speaking his language. Not only him, but they all were. Many a nights he said they had to go to bed without dinner because they spoke Indian during the day. So there was that effort on, on the, the, that part, you know, to do away with the language. They were going to take the Indians away from the reservation, take them out, and teach them how to live the way all good Americans live, right? Okay, so what they did was, I mean, they, were, they weren't real, um, how would you say, hum, humanistic about it, the way they went about it either. They, uh, they would beat them. They would beat them and they would punish them. They would do anything if they used their native language or if they practiced some of the, our, our uh, religious practices or any, any type of our usual cultural practices. They, they were very hard on them. Uh, where I have a personal problem with that is that uh, I don't speak our language. There are a lot of things about our religion and, and how we practice things that I don't know because my dad was one of those people who went to one of those boarding schools. And consequently, I was not taught the language. The government and missionaries claimed their teachings would help the Indians assimilate into the larger society which was becoming America. But others believe the government's true objective was genocide. I went through the boarding schools myself. Um, and my approach, my strategy was to learn as much from these people as I can while I'm here. There's a reason why I'm here. The people that were running the boarding schools, the people that were running the programs, the government uh, always have the attitude that one day soon we're not going to be here anymore. But the old ones came from the perspective that we're simply going to continue. The boarding school era did not result in genocide, but many Native Americans believe it did have a negative impact on their cultural heritage. There have been several people who did have a lot of the oral history who have tried to pass it on, who have tried to do something, and, and over the years there have been several programs come and go. That seems to be, that and the language programs are some of the things that seem to come and go. There will be a big push to have it instituted within the tribe, and then all of a sudden it will seem to disappear again. It's something that has never had any kind of continuity in it, and, and it's, it's a real problem. Um, hopefully there are enough people that have learned a lot of the oral history that can carry it on yet, but there's still a lot gone. In order to ensure that their culture is not lost, some tribes are combining the past with the future. The Coeur d'Alene Tribal School in Tinsed has developed a computer program to help ensure that future generations can learn their native language. Uh, in past years, um, they've had um, some of the elders come in and, and try to, to work with the kids and do lessons in the classroom. And, uh, it was really hard because the elders couldn't come on a daily basis and so this uh, works a lot better where we can do it every day and you know have reinforcement all the time and also I think just uh, the kids like the computers and I think that's a big help. Though they are using computers, the students can hear the recorded voice of an elder speaking the words. Friend Creek, tonight, tomorrow morning, Friend Creek. Tomorrow night. An invaluable tool when learning proper pronunciation. I think it's important because uh, there's down to just a handful of elders that can really speak the language. And uh, when that generation is gone, if we don't do something now to preserve it for these guys, well, they just won't have their language. And uh, very few of their parents speak the language, so hopefully, along with the, the children learning it, we can get some of the parents in here too. Yeah. As with most cultures, the preservation of heritage falls mainly to individual families. How one feels about their heritage is usually learned at home. I think in some families um, it has been 
either tucked away or is somewhere by the wayside. And it has to do with our history. It has to do with um, what we did to, to survive. Um, it has to do with um, some of the things that we went through as a people. And so that was uh, left somewhere, but people are going back to it and, and finding out what they can. And hopefully we haven't lost so much of it that we can still find it and deal with it. So people are at many different places in terms of, um, of their culture, but it's important. You know, we can't force it and we can't push it and we can't do anything with it, but if people want it, it needs to be there for them. Remember, it isn't a plain N, it's a N sound. Chant. That means where. Pauline Pascal Flett is a perfect example of this. She grew up speaking Spokane. She and her siblings did not learn English until they started grade school. This experience unconsciously changed how and what she taught her own children. I think maybe we had some um, uh, traumatic times trying to get people to understand what we were saying. We didn't want our children to go through that, so we made sure that they knew how to speak the language well. And then into high school, especially into high school, we want them to be on a competitive basis with everyone else. So to do that, well, we just completely stopped talking, except when mom and dad came to visit her, we all sat around talking. And we arranged for Now Pauline teaches everywhere. language classes and at Eastern Washington University. She has life. helped develop an alphabet so the Salish language can be preserved and taught in a written as well as oral form. A cell. Hen. But whether it be in a classroom or at a powwow, Pauline says she just wants to help people learn about her people's history. Every song has a meaning. Every song was uh, from some experience. And I wonder what kind of experience it is from. And if I can transfer this feeling to you and to others, and when you hear a song, it's going to be, it's going to sound different now because you think, boy, there must have been somebody behind that song. And so this is the kind of feeling that I want to create in both sides, the white side and the Indian side. Tribal members are finding individual ways of expressing themselves and their heritage. Cloudy vision of traditional egg. Sticks and bones until they break. Various artistic examples of this can be seen at what has become an annual event in Spokane called the Gathering of the Four Winds. The man who started this event is a musician and member of the Colville Confederated Tribes. The gathering blends elements of both the white and Indian worlds. Living on the reservation and off the reservation myself, I kind of had trouble fitting in both places sometimes. And I've got a song about that, in fact, too, but it's kind of a... But I just... Uh, and so now, actually, in my, in my recovery from alcohol, I'm, is, I'm probably learning more about traditional and traditional values and things now than I have in any other time in my life. And, and that's just what seems to be coming out more and more in my songs. Yeah. Star Spangled Banner, or the sound of the drum. Tell their own stories under the same sign. Well, I love this country, but I sometimes have my doubts. Yeah, my heart drops, but I'm proud. Yeah, my heart drops, but I'm proud. I can't forget how they killed John Kennedy. Can't forget what they did, I wounded me. Well, I've lived in two worlds, both wanting to be free. Don't 
trying to tell me what my country means to me. My heart drops, but I'm proud. supposed to be warriors. Another man who has found his own way of expressing himself is poet, screenwriter, and novelist Sherman Alexie. Nothing worse than being a nerd Indian kid. <laughs> Had those big old government glasses. Sherman grew up on the Spokane Reservation, and his experiences there are often the subject of his candid writings and performances. Made your eyes look like this. Man, my Indian name was Cyclops. He knows what it's like to succeed both on and uh, off the reservation. Job, you know. He also knows its As price. Well, sub chief of the Spokane tribe to build up pride. To be successful in the outside world, you know, I get portrayed as the Indian du jour, and, and I have to do some of that stuff to deal. I have to be seen as that, even though I'm fighting against it all the time. I get to be the spokesperson for my whole race which, you know, they never ask a white rider to be that. Nobody ever says John Updike, the white rider, uh, you know, but I have to deal with that. So in some ways, it's more of a personal sacrifice having to go through that. So any success I have in the outside world is tempered by all the sacrifices I have to make as a person. Uh, in the Indian world, uh, my success tends to divide my tribe uh, into two camps. I mean, the people who like me and the people who don't, who think I'm revealing secrets or airing dirty laundry. And then the other people who like what I'm doing, they see its positive attributes, that I'm, I'm talking about our lives and our stories, uh, things that nobody ever talks about. Uh, most books and movies are Indians in loincloths, you know, Indian New Age healers, not us living normal lives like everybody else does. songs that sound exactly like the old ones. Thank you. Teresa Ayel Santos is one of those normal people. Even while living with her husband and children away from the reservation, Teresa feels her identity is still tied to her heritage. It all depends on how you were raised and it depends on what you take with you. And if you take with you your sense of um, identity, the confidence in knowing who you are, the um, the identity that I have of being Coeur d'Alene and what that means to me, nobody can take it away from me no matter where I am. By bringing her children back to Cataldo, Idaho for the annual Coeur d'Alene pilgrimage, she carries on a family tradition. I come back to, um, to reestablish my ties with the community and with my family and to maintain an important tradition to um, to the Coeur d'Alene's. I mean, this, this area, this here is unique to the Coeur d'Alene tribe. And um, to me, this, this is a sacred, a sacred time, a special time, a time to have fun, um, to cook out, and just to be with family. I think that the, um, the trend of people living off and on reservation will continue. But I think it's really important that we have the people who are educated to go back to the reservations and to do what they need to do there to develop businesses and, and, and to save the resources and to create a really healthy environment there for the people. All of our culture is changing. All the traditions are changing. They're changing with um, the, every time it's handed down, it's changed. We lose things along the way, we adopt new things, we create new things, and so a lot of the culture has changed quite a bit. But um, the essence of it, I think, is still there. Another thing that the tribes of the Inland Northwest have kept the essence of is their will to be dealt with as individual nations. I think the biggest problem between the Indian communities and the non-Indian communities in this area is, is the recognition and understanding of treaty rights and exactly what treaties are and what, what treaty rights mean. Uh, I mean. They're not teaching that in, in non-Indian schools. In fact, they're not teaching it in Indian schools, for that matter, exactly what the treaties were. They were, you know, agreements 
legally binding agreements signed between the United States government and Indian tribes. Each agreement between a tribe and the United States is different, but there is a common theme that runs through them all. The Indian tribes of the United States were nations. We were sovereign people. We each had our own area where we lived and where we did whatever we did. And we governed ourselves. We made our own rules. We policed ourselves. And we did whatever was necessary to make sure that the, everybody in the tribe was okay. That's what a nation does. That's what we were, we were nations. And so when the United States came and got established and the people started coming into this area, the government of the United States recognized that. So when they came and made agreements with the tribes and asked us to cede lands, they, they said that they were going to recognize us as sovereign nations. And so we said, okay, we trust you. You'll go along with that. You take our land and all of our resources and our, our abilities to make a living, but you're going to have to comp compensate us for that. And essentially, that's what it amounts to right now. Debate over how to interpret the treaties signed in the 1800s began even before the ink was dry. Therefore, the relationship between the tribes and the federal government has also changed, and tribal members often feel they are covering the same ground again and again. A newly elected congressman, uh, especially, um, take a look at the tribes and, uh, and just can't understand uh, the, sovereign, the sovereignty of a, of a tribe. They look at the state government, who they're used to dealing with, and of course uh, the national government, which, which has uh, sovereignty, but uh, they don't really understand the treaties and agreements made by uh, their fathers and our fathers and, uh, and understand that it's the law of the land. One common interpretation of tribal members by non-members who live in surrounding communities is that natives have so-called super-citizen status, giving them more rights than non-tribal members. I see myself as standing in one world. Uh, I stand on uh, the history and tradition and heritage of uh, all of my ancestors before me, and that that goes back to the beginning of time right here. So I think uh, this idea of super citizen, uh, uh, I think, is simply another racist term that people use to try to divide people rather than recognize and respect uh, what is here and what has always been here and what continues to be here and will continue to be here. Indians became citizens in 1924 through an act of Congress. Uh, many people in this United States are citizens of multiple countries. You can be a citizen of Switzerland and a citizen of the United States. You can be a citizen, I believe, of Israel and a citizen of the United States. Um, you have rights in both. And that is the same with, with the tribes. They have rights as United States citizens and they have rights as citizens of their own country. One of those rights can include receiving periodic payments from the tribe. Many people see this as getting free money from the federal government, which keeps some of the tribe's holdings in trusts. But others say it should be described as a dividend, like that of a shareholder. All the lands here are owned by the people communally, basically. They're administered by the tribe. Most of the money that comes from that resource is kept by the tribe to run the government, and tribal members get some of it as a per capita check. It's not a check from the federal government. Now, the claim settlement in, one, in 181D will be, but that's just basically a payment on the contract for Grand Coulee Den. It's like paying, paying that off, but generally, tribes do not receive checks in the mail. The so-called payment for Grand Coulee Dam, he mentions, refers to a 50-year-old claim both the Spokane and Colville Confederated tribes filed against the U.S. government. Before this and other dams were built, the river systems of the inland northwest embodied the spirit of the area's tribes. I remember some stories Elders told in their own ways If you could picture in your mind About our ancestral glories The 
very peaceful the presence to hold on to through the days very loud over the mountain through the river and very very swift water clear and pure flowing and a group many groups of indians waiting to fish for their winter supply of salmon of white fish and others take me back on lonely river if you could see in your mind the smoke tell me all you got to say the smell of fish the sound of laughter the anticipation felt in the hearts of each one of those people as they waited to get their winter supply of salmon the salmon was their most important food because it was so versatile and there was a spiritual side to it the place where i would like to be we're not a fisherman tribe no more we have we have no salmon so what did our men our warriors do in that era they turned to alcohol because there was nothing in reality for them to do i mean they were kind of uh, just at a loss it, and it totally amazes me as a young person when i see this picture of all of our chiefs standing at grand coulee dam here is this picture of all of our chiefs standing there watching this thing being built and i've always wondered this what the hell are these uh, people thinking that's our whole way of life is being cut off right there it's going to change our whole life what were these people told why did they allow this why didn't they fight why didn't they die and stop this when cran coulee dam was built or considered they came to the reservation those folks that wanted to build this colossus and they said you know we're going to we're going to provide some payment to you we're going to, we know this is going to destroy your fishery. We know this is going to just be devastating to you as a people. And we're going to, we, they said, people in Indians said, well, we should get some benefit. They said, we're going to provide some benefit for you. And uh, we're going to provide a share of the revenue from Grand Coulee Dam. Well, they never did. Grand Coulee Dam produces power which lights homes all across the West. To do this, it holds back the waters of the Columbia River in a 50-some mile reservoir named Lake Roosevelt. On either side along this same stretch of river are the Spokane and Colville Indian reservations. So when the reservoir was filled back in 1942, the cities of Keller, Inchileum, and others were swallowed up by the rising waters. Businesses and residents had to move and rebuild at their own expense. The white waters of Kettle Falls, an ancient fishing ground, were also silenced. Buried by the very waters, that had once made them grand. They're using our land to store water to produce electricity, which they make money off of. So they have to pay for our using our land to make money. That's what it amounts to. In the late 1940s, the United States said, well, we may have made a few mistakes in the past, and we may have sort of underpaid you on occasion. And so tribes, we're going to give you a window to sue us. And the tribe did. That promise was finally kept in part through the, uh, the settlement of the, of the Grand Coulee case. And the tribe now does receive a portion of the revenue from Grand Coulee. But that merely is part of the promise that was made uh, to the tribes in the, in the 30s when the United States came and said this is what we're going to do. It is no way makes up for the loss that the tribe has suffered and it cannot make up for that loss. It's people like me who say, boy, isn't this great? 
And there's people that are members of the tribe that point out that there are no more salmon up here, uh, at least very few, none above Grand Coulee Dam. We can't gather our, 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 uh, our roots anymore. Our graveyards are underwater. And this may make good sense to you, but we'll, we'll take the money, but it's not, it doesn't compensate for what happened. Most people agree we can never go back to the way things used to be, but they hope that by learning what it was like, even if through seminars and classes, we can gain a clearer picture of tomorrow. Somewhere in our eagerness to get ahead in, another, in other directions, we have forgotten to take care of Mother Earth, of the fish, the water. And it makes us glad to have a group like this gather and maybe we can do something. We'll never get all the things back that we had, the, the salmon. But we can work together to see what we can do, to see what lies ahead. The relationship between the United States and Native Americans has never been clear-cut. Changing times and interpretations of what the treaties mean layer one on top of the other. In recent years, Native Americans have been learning to fight on a new battleground, the courts. Using their own attorneys, they are hacking through the legal underbrush, trying to ensure that interpretations of the law will favor them. Most tribes feel they need not deal with the individual states where their reservations are located, but only with the federal government. So from state to state, the relationships between the tribe and states vary. It can even vary from tribe to tribe. Take gambling, for example, an issue opened up by the Indian Regulatory Act. Basically, th this was an act of Congress in 1988. And that was a result of years of battling between states and tribes. It was an attempt by Congress to finally set up a regulatory framework. And really, it was a great opportunity for states. People don't realize that because it gave the states a chance to play a role. And for many tribes, that was very offensive. Um, the act basically looked at gambling, so there's three types. Class one, traditional type games, historical, the Indian stick game, for example. Uh, states have nothing to do with that. Neither, neither does, does the federal government, strictly tribal. The game isn't um, just gambling. It's many, many things, and it's a year-round activity for Indian people. The in intricacies of the songs and the things they do to prepare themselves and how they go on taking care of themselves and their equipment, like sticks and bones and the things that they use, but those are very private. Class two gaming is bingo, pull tabs, punch boards, non-banking card games, um, poker, if you will. Uh, if a state allows those, a tribe can do those as well, free from state regulation. And that's really the majority of the gaming we had in Washington State prior to the act. And class three is everything that's not one and two. That's lotteries, blackjack, craps, roulette, everything but uh, one and two. And in order for a tribe to do class three, they must have what's called a tribal state compact. It requires the tribe and the state to negotiate how it will be set up, the scope, the regulation, who does what, licensing background, etc. And we've negotiated 19 compacts in Washington State. On the west side of Washington, tribes have made compacts with the state that dictate things like the hours of operation and how high the stakes can be. Not so much because they think the state has a right to, but because it's easier than going to court. Due to the large population base they have to draw from, tribes on the west side can operate under these rules and still have a chance of turning a profit. Here on the east side of Washington, however, it is a different story. The Spokane Reservation is removed from large populations, so this tribe feels that doing as the state wants would be economically unsound. That's why when it comes to gambling, the Spokane are leading the charge against the state. Since it is a sovereign nation, the tribe does not feel that the state of Washington can dictate how it runs its gaming operations. The state 
disagrees. Right now they're operating without a compact. They're operating sl uh, slot machines that, that, that uh, the state believes obviously are not legal in the state. Uh, there's a federal court case, the U.S. v. Spokane, that's pending right now. And that'll, that will ultimately set the future for the Colville gaming operation, as well as the Spokane. That case has been winding its way through the courts for years. At issue are slot machines, craps, blackjack, roulette, and other casino-style games played on the reservation. The U.S. Justice Department contends the games violate state and federal laws. So in the meantime, not wanting to lose time or money, the Spokane tribe decided to put in slot machines until the federal government told them otherwise. Washington State tried to stop this, but the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled that the machines could stay at least until the court determined the final ruling on the matter. The stay was granted in 1994. Right after that, the Colville tribe moved video slot machines into the temporary home of its Mill Bay Casino on Lake Chelan. For the Colvilles, this was not so much a matter of sovereignty as economics. The Colville Tribal Enterprise Corporation, which is the economic arm of the tribe, currently employed, or prior to Mill Bay, employed about 450 employees. Uh, on June 4th, uh, we added an additional 350 employees uh, to that base. So uh, we've practically doubled the employment uh, for the corporation of the tribe. Because of the Ninth Circuit Court's ruling in the Spokane's case, the Colvilles determined that the Spokane's would be able to play slot machines for anywhere from six months to two years while the case makes its way through the system. Installing video slot machines of their own has probably kept their casino in business. It took two to three years for the U.S. Attorney to bring an action. Uh, there was a temporary restraining order issued by, by the court. That was then stayed by the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. So during that stay, the, tribes, the Spokane tribe has been able to operate pending review, which is the way it should be done. Um, the the Caldwell tribe followed suit. Um, they had tried to operate without slot machines in that location. And the bottom line is simply this, in, in, in those locations you have to have slot machines. And slot machines are the gold of gaming. Um, it's very tough to make it without them, everybody knows that. The issue here really is uh, economic development, creating an economy for the reservation, uh, and employing some of uh, the 3,500 tribal members who live on the reservation who now don't have jobs, can't provide for their families. Uh, we're trying to raise their standards of living, uh, trying to make uh, a, re a revenue for the tribe to provide for education, uh, to provide for uh, homes on the reservation, um, all of those types of things that will raise the standard of living of tribal members. Though the gains from gambling could be short-lived, they are gains that the tribes hope will lead to other opportunities. We'll have to explore all the options available to us, but in relationship to whether gaming machines stay uh, uh, here at Mill Bay uh, or on the Colville Indian Reservation or even in the Spokane case, it, it all comes down to uh, what the federal courts decide. Um, we certainly are not going to violate whatever the ruling is of, of the federal courts, uh, but we will take every opportunity to protect ourselves and, and to continue uh, this increase in employment for the reservation and increase the revenues to the tribe for social programs. The real issue here is not gaming, is not a dispute between the state of Washington uh, or the U.S. attorney or the federal government. The real issue here is that there's 52 percent unemployment on this reservation and tribal members need these jobs. And that's what we're all about, creating this economic development for tribal members so that they can support their families, they can live just as anyone else does in this country, have the same standard of living that you and I do, send their kids to college um, so that we can, we can better our lives. That's what it's all about. I'd much rather have our kids dealing cards here and that type of thing, learning a profession, uh, getting into the administration of this organization and you, doing something useful with their lives rather than doing something that's not useful for their lives and becoming a problem for society. There, there are hundreds of more people working because of our casinos and our bingo hall and people are trying to take that away from us. And then if they take it away from us, all these people are out of jobs, they go back on public assistance, then they'll be complaining about us being a public assistance. So then we try to do something else again to, to get off public assistance. So it's, it's a circle. To break this circle, many tribes are now using tactics similar to those of other minority groups. They have formed alliances which increase their numbers and lobbying power. The tribes of the inland northwest 
have banded together with others to form the affiliated tribes of Northwest Indians. And I'm glad you brought up the reduction from the agency stand. At annual the, meetings, these elected representatives set the priorities the tribes will pursue together throughout the coming year. They also take the opportunity to make their views known to government officials. I don't know where the tribal co consultation is supposed to come in, Stan. I, I, the the Colville's never have been consulted on any of this. We never the Bureau of Indian Affairs has always been the administrative link between the tribes and the U.S. government. Historically, its word was law, but that is changing. The BIA today is role is so much different. Uh, we work on a government-to-government -government relationship with tribes. We uh, partnership with tribes in managing their resources, uh, whether it's land, whether it's um, timber resources, and uh, so forth. And that's a major change from where we were many, many years ago. And as time passes, it is expected that the BIA's role will slowly be eliminated. It's just not a matter of eliminating the tribes, it's a matter of eliminating the BIA. It's getting out of the uh, Bureau out of the daily affairs of the tribes and it's putting the tribes in a position so that they can perform and really truly make decisions on their own about uh, their own resources, their own property, managing that property, managing the resources, and at the same time being able to work toward economic development, providing education programs for their members, and uh, the other thing is getting into economic development and becoming more self-sufficient. When tribes are, are ready to really take over, and be able to bear the cost of being able to meet their needs, I think they would be the first to let the federal government know that. And they, they should be given that opportunity. We reduced Indian programs by 8%. We take the education programs, the health programs, and the Bureau of Tribal members say they do want to be self-sufficient, but they are not about to let the U.S. government forget its treaty obligations. I guess times do change. You can say times change. But the, the United States has a constitutional responsibility and that uh, unless the United States government changes to something else, we don't see any change in that constitutional responsibility they have. I think the treaties will, uh, will remain intact. I think the agreements with the tribes will remain intact. But I think there will be an effort to change how the federal government, how Congress deals with, uh, with tribes. Times change as, as, as different administrations take over. I like to see um, a policy that was uh, continued on and couldn't be changed by the different administrations. That there would be a recognition of tribal sovereignty, that would be a recognition of treaties, of uh, executive orders, recognition of, 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 of Indian tribes, recognize any Indian tribes, and that be part of the policy so that we wouldn't have to be fighting that, that battle and introducing ourselves over and over and over again. What path our future will take is never set in stone, yet the one thing that remains constant is the desire of those whose ancestors called this their home. And that desire is to have more than one nation occupy this sovereign land. You can receive your own copy of Sovereign Nations by calling 1-800-735-2377. Your payment of $35 will bring you both hours of this historical look at the nations of the inland northwest and includes all shipping and handling charges.